Jesus asked in the Sermon on the Mount. So you need to read Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. Okay, Matthew 5, 6, 7. And you'll find questions that Jesus posed. As he was teaching, he asked questions because he was a good teacher. And good teachers ask questions. They find out where we are, what we know, what we're looking to. And so that's uh, next couple of Thursdays. So I've counted at least 15 questions. So we'll have plenty to, to chew over. So that's th Thursdays. Um, three weeks tonight, as Jackie mentioned last week, we're looking to do, just trying to get people to, to the gospel and hear the gospel, to do a, a cream tea because it's the Queen's Platinum. So that's uh, two, uh, three weeks tonight, cream tea. Well, I'll be there anyway. What do you say? For the cream tea? i got to be there. No. But you know what? It's just another opportunity to invite people, get them in, um, and the gospel will be obviously presented because our Queen is, uh, loves the gospel. And so we'll tell them, this is what the Queen wants you to hear. Bless the Lord. So that's three weeks. Um, and, and don't forget, pray for... Uh, Franklin Graham, he was in Liverpool last night. He's in Newport next Saturday. We'll be going down about half past five, as it said on there. So pray for that. Pray people will come to know him. People who know him will be stirred to get the evangelism. You know, see, God wants us to tell people and show people, isn't he? Evangelism on our hearts. Amen. So we're in, in uh, Genesis, our foundational book. Um, they say about Genesis, it's one of the most attacked books of the Bible, plus probably Revelation. Because, of course, that's where we get our foundations from. Our foundations of, uh, of uh, humanity, our foundations of who God is, the foundations of, of, of sin and redemption, and all the things we find in Genesis. And, it, of course, when we, we call it figurative and metaphorical and all those kind of things, then what happens? We weaken what God has said about something. And, of course, we, we talked about the, the principle of first mention. That's why Genesis is so important. We find out what it says first about something, and that sets us up to what God is saying. And uh, two weeks ago, go back, Josh. Uh, um, we looked at the first questions of the Bible. The first question was from Satan, remember? Um, doubting, uh, that's his, that, so we see the character who's asking. We see the character of whom they're asking to see what they are. You know, it's great if, if you um, get an old Bible. This is old. So you can write in it. You can underline certain things. Because you know what? If you write, it's good to have a notepad. Nothing wrong with a notepad. If you know where you can find a notepad. i got so many notepads. I'm thinking, I've written that down somewhere. And I don't. But you know, if you write it in, in an old Bible, you, you can go right to the, and you can know where it is. So here's the first question. And of course, uh, then we see the first question of God. See his heart. Where are you? What are you, what, who have you been talking to? Where, what have you done? And then we see as we come, and we're looking at Cain and Abel today. This morning, we're looking at what it reveals about God. And tonight, we're going to look at what it reveals about man. And uh, we'll see how we deal with anger. And uh, we see uh, this is the epitome of anger. But you know what? Just uh, You only have to look at our world, don't you? You see how, what anger can do. Where parents will kill children. You say, well... Sometimes I wanted to strangle them, and sometimes you do. But you know, but they've literally, literally killed, um, and that's a frightening thought. But that's where anger can take us, and we'll look at that tonight. So this book, Genesis four, there's a lots of firsts again in it in this. So again, we need to underline because when it says things at first, we need to see it's the first siblings, Cain and Abel. Obviously, they must have gone originally, but it certainly didn't go on at the end, did they? Um, the first two people we know that are recorded with a sinful nature. Adam and Eve weren't born with a sinful nature. They chose to sin, but they weren't born. Now, Cain and Abel were the first two that we recorded born with a sinful nature. So keep that in mind, because that's and you'll see the, 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 the downward spiral of humanity. And you look at the seven generations from Adam and Eve to, uh, to the last one, and he was arrogant. And uh, said, yeah, it came uh, seven times, 77 times, and someone who hurt me, and I killed him, and there's great arrogance. And we, so we see the two, but they started with, um, of course, started with Adam and Eve, but then we see the two, we see the first recorded act of worship. First recorded act of worship. Obviously, the first murder. And also, again, to underline this, the first mention of sin. The first mention of sin. So all those things you can 
for underlying, because those are very important. Certainly the, the first mention of sin and the first mention of worship, of course. And so we see straight away the heart of God, the character of God coming through in this particular story. We see that, as I put that, I, I like a bit of alliteration, so that's why I've gone over the seas. Something's not always work. Um, but the first thing we know <clears throat> is God knows everything. God sees everything. And uh, now Cain should have known that because Adam and Eve would have told him, look, we tried to hide from God, but God knew where we were. And uh, God's question, where are you, was not for his benefit. Of course, it's the questions that God asks are for our, always our benefit to see where we are, what was what's going on. And uh, Cain should have known that, but of course, uh, he didn't, or he thought he could pull the wool over God's eyes, as we always do. We think God doesn't know everything about us. You know, he's under no illusions with you, is he? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. So he comprehends. He knows everything. The Bible, as the Bible says, um, Great is the Lord, Psalm 147, and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Not, not limited, infinite, the Bible says. Uh, Isaiah 40, he's saying, who's known the greatness of God, the wonder of God? Look at creation, he says. His understanding, I like this word, is inscrutable. Oh, I love that word. It's a great word, isn't it? Um, unsearchable, really, is, the, is another word, but inscrutable. His understanding is inscrutable. 1 John 3 says, God knows all things. He's a God that comprehends. He knows, he sees, he sees our hearts. That's why he could challenge Cain, not about the peripheral, but at the very heart of his life. And that's what he does to us. See, he knows the very heart. He, he's, we sometimes like to deal with the peripheral, but God speaks right to where we are, right in the center. And of course, Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is sharp and active, sharp and any sword, dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, soul and spirit, dividing soul. And then next verse, Nothing in all creation is hidden from him. Everything is laid bare and naked before him of whom we must give an account. So the first thing we notice in this part, God sees. And he sees our hearts because he saw Cain's anger. So much so, Cain, what didn't, the trouble is Cain didn't even hide it, did he? Well, I think he, he did a bit for, from his brother, uh, because we'll see that in a moment or maybe tonight. But uh, the Bible says his face was downcast. He, even his, he, he, he let it affect him so much. Can't we let our emotions run over us? And of course, they do sometimes. But the Bible says, rise up. Rise up. We deal with them. We don't deny them. We don't let them dictate our lives. We deal with them. Bless the Lord. God gives us the tools to deal with. So God comprehends. God comprehends. Um, this word, consecrate, again, is really God is holy. God is holy. I've been reading this week at uh, when he was, and uh, he's saying uh, the, the one characteristic that is, and I, you know, you sometimes forget, you, you, we would say, what is the one characteristic the Bible emphasizes about God more than anything else? Probably we would say God is love. But he said, not really, if you count them up. He said the greatest uh, characteristic or essential nature that God reveals himself is holy holy see what what are the angels singing around the throne holy 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 well not maybe not our tune but it's a good tune holy is the lord god almighty the holiness of god the separateness the purity the splendor the brightness the separation from sin holiness of god and you see, as soon as we forget that essential nature that holds God and holds all the other characteristics together, what happens? Instead of being holy love, it becomes a sentimental love. So that's what we have today, even in the church, a sentimental love. But God is holy. His it's, it's love is holy. So it, it, it's, it's pure, it's wonderful, it's mighty. Holiness of God. Um, D.L. Moody said this, a holy life will make the deepest impressions. Lighthouses sometimes blow horns, but they do shine. They do shine. They do shine. 
C.S. Lewis said this, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. It is irresistible. Holiness of God. The holiness of God. God is holy. And in that holiness, he reveals what he is. He reveals the hatred of things. And he tells us what he hates. He hates sin. He hates sin. That's why he challenged Cain. He hates sin because he sees its destructive purposes. And we see the ruination of many lives. You only got to turn your TVs on and watch the, the, the news. And you see the end result of sin. Oh, yes, that little, 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 little start, isn't it? Oh, I can manage this. I can handle that. And, and it, oh, it was just a mistake. It was just something fleeting until it grabs hold of you. And then you've got a, you've got a job to shake it off. You've got a job to shake that characteristic off or, or that whatever it is, a habit, a, a flaw. It's unbelievable how sin grabs a hold of us. And so we see the character of God coming out. He is holy, holy. And he's not afraid to confront us. Don't be afraid. See, we see in a moment what, what, what God does. He will confront us. Now, some of us don't like confrontation. Some of us like confrontation too much, maybe, in the wrong, on the wrong times. But God, right at the heart of the issue. Right at the heart. Of it. So we see God's heart. But ultimately, God cares, doesn't he? He cares enough to, uh, to come to Cain and speak right into his life. See, love tells, tells us that we're wrong. You know, it, we, we, we've all seen children who were spoiled, haven't we? We're up the, up the pond yesterday and watching a little girl. And she wanted her own way. I said, I don't give her your own way now. Well, of course, you've got a job to touch him now, can't you? can't breathe on him now. <clears throat> I said, come to the car a minute, my dear. I've got something in the car for you. <laughs> Yeah, but left to their own devices, left to our, our own devices, what will happen? Am I my brother's keeper? Selfishness, me, I, my way, we go our own way. And it's, it's ruination for us and for those around us. God is holy, but God cares enough to come and say, Oi, Dave, and he's a God that disciplines. He's a God that disciplines. Do not despise the Lord's discipline. Because those he loves, he reproves. See, again, we've, we've, we've got this sentimental love. Oh, God loves you, and you just carry on doing what you want. What kind of father is that? You'll have a knock at the door from the police. Oh, your son, he's just stolen something. He's gone into trouble. He's done this and that. And uh, not always the parents' fault, of course. But if the parents haven't squared him up and said no, then you're expecting problems, aren't you? You're expecting trouble. So God longs. You know why? Because God, as we just said before, he wants us to reflect him. That question, what have you done? What have you done? It's a great question. Let me look at that sometime. What have you done? He wants us to be like him. So he's a God that cares. It's a God that is con he's holy. He's a God that knows. Can't hide from him. Can't hide anything from him. And so we see in this great, we begin to see the picture of who God is. Begin to see the picture of who God is. And of course, we have this uh, first mention of worship. And um, we understand, and we see it there, that uh, Cain brought, and it's very clear, uh, he brought some of the fruits from his garden. Now, can I say that, uh, we'll go on to the blood sacrifice in a minute, that that was not necessarily wrong, because it, we know, if we look at, at, the, at the, the festivals, Jewish festivals, they brought the first fruits of the grain, wheat and the barley and the fruits at harvest time. So in one sense, the fruit wasn't the, the issue. It was what kind of fruit? He didn't bring the first fruits. He brought, he looked around and thought, what's left over here? I mean, that'll be, that'll be okay for the Lord. That'll be okay for the Lord. See, that's religion. Religion, now he wasn't a religious because he wanted to worship, but it wasn't with a whole heart. You see, what he gave exposed his heart. And the Bible tells us very clearly it wasn't by faith. And it was substandard. Because the Bible, Hebrews 11, 4, by faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice. Better in quality and quantity 
A superior sign. Why? Because he brought it by faith and by generosity and genuineness. Generosity and genuineness. See, that's where it was faith. You see, when you bring, we talked about this before, when you bring the first, it's faith, isn't it? Because you've got to trust God for the rest. Because you bring in the first. What if you didn't have anything else after? Ooh, if that was the firstborn and there was nothing after, that's faith. That's why God says the first is mine, number one, because he's God and we are just stewards. We're owner. We, we don't own anything. We're just managing it. So everything we have is God's. And, and so when we come to worship, it is all for him. Why? Because he's out of relationship. We know now God, when we see who God is, when we see the holiness of God, when we see that he understands everything, how can we not stand in awe of him and worship uh, there was a story of um, a man, he was walking by a church, and outside the church was standing Satan. Satan was standing on the pavement outside the church. And um, the man sa- looked and said, doesn't this bother you? This church service, doesn't the church service bother you? He said, no, it doesn't bother me at all, he said. They get that way on a Sunday, but they'll be all right on Monday morning, he said. They'll be back to where they were. And they'll have, this, this is just a little habit they've acquired. That can be us sometimes. It can be religion, it can be a habit, and not everything for the Lord. See, the Bible tells us to love the Lord of God with all heart, mind, and strength. So be careful now when, when we say, um, I can't afford it, I haven't got time, I'm too busy. Be very careful when you use those words because one day you'll stand before the Lord. God Almighty, and we'll say those, those, those real, not even excuses, lies really, if you, if you really want to be honest, isn't it, will fade into insignificance. Why? Because God is God. And the more we get to know, see, why worship? C.S. Lewis, but this, it was, was, it was sort of pondering always, why does God need worship? Well, God doesn't need worship, does he? We need worship. And, and when C.S. Lewis thought, well, because he was, he was trying to see it from man's point of view, is God got an ego problem? Does God need to be? Uh, no, no, no. See, in worship, there's a joyful exchange. I think it was uh, Luther or Calvin said, one of those, where we receive of the Lord. There is no place greater than in the place where we are worshiping him, where we receive, we enjoy him. God wants us to enjoy him. What's the... the, the, the uh, to know God and to enjoy him forever. That's the summation of man. That's what they say, isn't it? That's what we are here for. To worship, to worship thoughtfully, passionately, practically, because obviously, ultimately, everything we do is worship. It isn't just a time when we come. Our lives are an offering of worship. Once we understand that, you know, churches will be full. Churches will be, the prayer meeting will be full. Bible study would be full. Why? Because we understand who God is. And uh, they'll be knocking the doors down. You'll be knocking the doors down. Dave, we want to worship the Lord. We want to get... Why? Because we know who he is and we just long to spend time with him in his presence and with the people of God. There's no place better to be. Place to be. And of course, we see in the, in the New Testament the offerings that we should bring. And we can read. We've done those before. Or ultimately, it's ourselves. Present yourselves an a, a offering. Living sacrifice, fellowship is an offering. Coming together today is, is, is an offering to the Lord. Loves it. Faith, good deeds, our service, money. Why? Because money represents what we've worked for, what we've invested, what, we, uh, what we've put our lives into. Praise. Praise is an offering. Now, it's a sacrifice sometimes. But, oh, Lord, we will praise him because he's worthy. And see, praise takes our mind off here and now and our circumstances and our problems and all. And it takes us to, the, to that, different, that, that new dimension, if you like, <laughs> if you want of a better word, into heaven, into heavenly places. So we see here uh, this, this, this mess of worship in Cain's eyes. It was just religion. What will just do? What will do? And you see, that's man's problem. Man is not irreligious, as we said before. No. But they will go to here and there and make gods of their own making. They'll even come to church or a church because there'll be a god of our own making that 
doesn't really challenge us, doesn't really caution us or ch chasten us. No, that's not our God. Our God wants the best for us. He wants our heart. Once we put our lives in his hands, now easy? Oh, no, 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 no. We make it difficult for ourselves sometimes, of course. But um, God's good, isn't he? God's good. And we see the worship that God longs for uh, to be regarded. And we don't know what happened with the sacrifice, how it, the Bible, how it was regarded. People have speculated. The Bible is, is silent on it because that's not the real issue. The real issue was the heart. Cain's heart was not right. God knew it. God spoke into it. And then we see God really getting hold of him. Why? Why are you angry? Why are you downcast, he said. Why? Why are you like that? Because you've not given me a heart. You've not given that which is good. You've given scraps. You've given the rubbish. And again, that's, that's, the, that's the, the pattern of man, isn't it? Always the same. In Jesus' day, what did he get angry over? The place, the temple of the living God, which should have been a, a house of prayer. But it had become a den of thieves. It was a place of commerce where they were ripping people off. Remember, we talked about the dilution of worship, then the distortion of worship, then the deception, well, the departing of worship, really, and then we're open to deception. That's what happens. We're open to deception then. When we dilute worship, when prayer goes, when prayer leaves a fellowship, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble. Because then God has, God's not in the, in the place or God's not invited. Because that's one thing he wants more than anything else is intimacy with us. Time with us. To walk with us. To talk with us. See, the problem with Cain, as we look tonight, is this issue was never dealt with. So then the Bible talks about uh, he was of the devil in, uh, uh, what, what was that, in 1 John 3. And of course then in Jude, it talks about the way of Cain. See, the way of Cain is the walk of Cain, the journey of Cain. It was not a split decision, was it? It was a process that led into a lifestyle. God challenges heart. Why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Why? Because you've, you've conned yourself by conning me. You don't, you don't con God, do you? We con God. We con ourselves. If we think we're... No, God loves us. He wants our hearts to come and worship with all our hearts. He said, if you do well, if you do well, if you do what is right, you will be lifted. In fact, he said, your countenance will be lifted. Woohoo! Do you want to be... Do you want your countenance lifted this morning? Praise the Lord. Give him your heart. Praise him. Get your money out. Give, it to the, give something away. Bless the Lord. Yeah. Write a check out. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord's work. Give it to somebody. Why? Do what the Lord... Your countenance will be lifted. But listen now. The Lord challenges him, corrects him. But now there's a caution. There's a caution from God. Because God loves us too much not to tell us the consequences of our actions. What does the Bible say? You will surely die if you touch this. You will surely, if you let sin have its way, you will surely die. He said, let me tell you, use your caution. If you don't do well, and use the first mention of sin, we see that we, when we, we limit, when we take sin down to mistakes or a slip up or an error, we miss the power of sin. Sin is crouching at your door. The picture there is of, a, of an animal just about to pounce, like a lion. You've seen them, haven't you? They, they're crouching, and they just, they see that deer. They're, they're lurking, they, and they're hoping the deer doesn't hear them. And they, 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 they're massive things, but they, they, they're down low, and they crouch through the undergrowth, ready to pounce. And he says he's ready to pounce on you. His desire is for you. He's stretching after you. Sin wants to destroy you. But you must master it. What does the Bible say? Guard your heart. For out of it is the wellspring of life. That entrance to your life. Sin is ready to have its way. Why? Because the Bible says devil always wants room and ground in your life. What did he say? 
Don't say, Lord, if you're going to send us out, out of this man, don't send us out of this area, didn't he? Don't send us, let us stay here. Get into them pigs, he said. And pigs went down there. The Bible says, do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a place, a topic. The word means topic. Don't give him an area. Ephesians 4, 27. In the context, I suppose, there is our behavior, any behavior. And, of course, anger is one of those. It's very interesting that uh, Paul lifts that from Genesis, doesn't he? In your, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Be angry and sin not, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. Then he says the devil will have a foothold. And he's, de he's de getting that scripture from the story of Cain. Because the Bible says sin is at your door. He wants to have you. You must master it. Now, God convicts. God convicts. But the choice to confess and repent is yours and mine. We wish God would, you know, run over some people. And, and God can do, God will convict us to such an point where we are, we are begging him. <laughs> but the choice and the replace of confession is yours and mine. It's left to me and you. Because we see Cain here was challenged by God, was chastened, was cautioned by God. He said, be very careful now, Cain, because this will take you far, far away. Sin will grab a hold of you and will take you down. But he didn't listen. He didn't listen. And the Bible tells us very clearly, don't give sin any room. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's using, he's using sort of extreme metaphors there, language, to tell us how powerful sin is. Because we know every one of us lives on this earth. We've got, we've got into places where we've thought, how oh, am I going to get out of this? We've done things, said things, uh, we've got into habits where we, they've gripped us and we are, we, we're sinking. And God says there's only one thing to do then is be absolutely ruthless. He says do not give any room, don't give any forethought for your flesh. Do, and in fact, he says do, Romans 6, 7, 8, live by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. There's a choice, there's, a, there's an aggression against sin. Be strong against sin. Why? Because once it's got a hold of it, it's, it's crouching at the door. The first mention of sin is not something that we're to be playing with. It's something to be avoided and to be running away from. Paul says, uh, Timothy, flee, flee youthful lusts. Don't be hanging around where you shouldn't be. Run, run, run. He who runs away lives to fight another day. And uh, that's true enough. Run from those things. Uh, so here we see the warning the warning was rebuffed. The word was refused. The way was rejected. God's will was resisted. Rebellion was chosen. And ruin and ruination ravaged Cain. So we see God's heart this morning. God loves us. Not to let us stay where we are, and we see God looking right at our hearts this morning, knowing where we are, knowing what we are, and he speaks to our hearts. He doesn't go around the periphery, he says, why, Dave, why is this, why is that? Why? Because he, he's, 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 a, he's a good God. He's a chastening God. Dave, it is time that, that those excuses you make for not being what you should be, for not loving God for, with all your heart, come on, they're just excuses. Cain brought what was what was left over? Abel brought that which was faith, that which was better, that which came from his heart. Lord, you, you've given me this. This isn't, this isn't mine. Here's the firstlings and the fat, which is very interesting how you put that on because Leviticus 3 says the fat is always mine. Before he ever wrote it down, okay, Abel knew out of revelation from the Lord. He knew who God was this morning. When we know who God is, we see out of his questions, we see God's heart. We see God's character. And tonight we'll see just a little bit, even just glimpsed of Cain, man's heart. And remember, this is where we are. This is all of us tonight, today, Cain. We love religion, but oh, God wants relationship. God wants everything. And the devil will whisper, and lie and deceive. Oh, no, Dave, Dave, you, you can't afford that. 
you're too busy. What about this? What that's going to suffer. This is going to suffer. That's going to suffer. And Jesus stands up again and says, seek first the kingdom and all his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Let's come on the breaking of bread. Hallelujah.